So for the next lecture, I'll be talking about colon cancer screening and the role and value of virtual colonoscopy. And maybe if I could just get a show of hands, who's doing virtual colonoscopy for any reason now? Failed colonoscopy screening? So it actually looks like a fair number of people. And that's very encouraging to me because when I first gave this lecture here four or five years ago, I think one person raised their hand and it was Alec. <clears throat> but I think people are slowly starting to, uh, to, to catch on that it actually has a very important role. Everything that I'm going to say in this lecture, I'm going to be saying a lot, is, uh, is on our website, virtualcolonoscopy.med.nyu.edu, all the references, and actually a lot of other information. So rather than writing things down, you can access all this information on that website. What I'm going to talk about is colon cancer and the epidemiology of it, the current screening techniques that are available, the significance of polyps, and particularly the significance of small polyps, because it's something that we hear a lot from gastroenterologists as a particular limitation of virtual colonoscopy. And then obviously talk about the current role of virtual colonoscopy and the future role. When you start to get images, endoluminal images that look like this, and this is performed on a four slice scanner, you know, it's very difficult if you, you get good distension to really miss any clinically relevant lesions in a case like this, such as this 15 millimeter adenoma hanging off of a fold. Now, just as a background, uh, there's about 150,000 new cases of colon cancer diagnosed every year in this country. But importantly, actually, the latest figures seem to indicate that that number has been decreasing. And in fact, maybe it's about 142,000 estimated for the year 2005. It's thought that the widespread uh, implementation of colonoscopy and polypectomy is resulting in this decrease in the incidence of colon cancer. And, and again, that's very encouraging that we are actually doing something to decrease the, more, uh, the number of cases, and in fact, probably the mortality related to colorectal cancer. Yet still, there's about 50,000 deaths in this country every year, and that equates to 137 deaths per day, and if I do my math correctly, about six per hour. So during the time that Alec and I give my lectures, six people in this country will have died from colon cancer. And that's really unfortunate because, as we all know, the vast majority of colorectal cancer develops from this adenoma carcinoma sequence. And when I say the vast majority, it's estimated about 85 to 90 percent of all cases of colon cancer develop through this sequence of events where mutations occur slowly over time, such that tubular adenomas form, tubular villus changes, villus adenomas, and then ultimately invasive carcinoma. This is worked out in 1975 in an article uh, in Cancer by Muto, and actually has been uh, validated since then. A couple of things about this slide. It's important to remember that the vast majority of tubular adenomas never undergo this sequence of events to become invasive cancer. And that's uh, evidenced by the fact that at autopsy studies of elderly patients, about 60% of men and 45% of women have tubular adenomas in the colon. The other thing that's important about this slide is that if you do have a tubular adenoma, and again, the vast majority of them will never progress, those that do progress, progress very slowly. So if you have let's say a five millimeter tubular adenoma, the natural history of that tubular adenoma, if it is going to become a cancer, is one that it takes a long period of time, maybe 10 to 15 years. So there is an opportunity to screen and to do surveillance for these uh, diminutive lesions. Not every tiny lesion needs to be removed if it is detected. While this has really been worked out in 1975, it's interesting to note that, and this slide was given to me by Dr. Sid Winower, He's a gastroenterologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering who's been a champion of colon cancer screening. That in fact, if you look at the date of this uh, particular article, May 1928, the article was written by Lockhart, Mummery, and Dukes, Dukes from the colon cancer staging system, that even back then there was thought that there are precancerous changes in the rectum and colon that will lead to colon cancer. That is the adenoma carcinoma sequence. This is a long time. And yet we still have the problems with the number of colon cancers. And you know, every week I will see a case, at least one, maybe even two, something like this, where you have a large invasive adenocarcinoma in the right colon. It's invading into the pancreas, into the duodenum, into the ventral aspect of the right kidney. This is a T4 lesion. That is a lesion that's invaded. The primary tumor has invaded into adjacent organs. There's a cluster of lymph nodes in the adjacent mesentery, so it's an N2 lesion. This is a stage three colon cancer. This is already a few years old, this case. This patient is no longer with us, despite aggressive surgery and, and chemotherapy. Um, and so there's a problem with the current colon cancer screening techniques that we have. If we look 
as I said, about 85% uh, of colon cancers develop through that adenoma carcinoma sequence, and even the vast majority of these uh, patients that have risk factors, such as fami uh, family history, if you have a first-degree relative before the age of 60, you're at an increased risk of developing colon cancer. If you yourself had a previous large adenoma or chronic ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease in the colon or hereditary conditions such as non-polyposis colon cancer syndromes or familial adenomatous polyposis, as this slide shows, I mean, somebody like this has a 100% chance of developing colon cancer unless they have a total colectomy as prophylaxis. But even if we look at these uh, patients, they make up about 15% of all people that get colon cancer. And it's the vast majority of people that do get colon cancer that have absolutely no symptoms. And therefore, screening recommendations have been implemented, and basically screening should begin at the age of 50. And if you have no family history or any, any risk factors. And, and the current American Gastroenterological Association's recommendations are such that at the age of 50, you should undergo fecal occult blood testing. In addition, Either sigmoidoscopy, believe it or not, a double contrast BE is still on those recommendations, and a colonoscopy. And if those are negative, then those tests can be repeated at five or ten year intervals. I think that while we're fighting in radiology to a certain extent to keep the double contrast BE on this list, very little screening with a double contrast BE is being performed these days. The AGA actually says that virtual colonoscopy is a promising technique, and the more I talk to gastroenterologists, the more I realize that they really are catching on to the, util uh, the possibility to use virtual colonoscopy for colon cancer screening. And I would recommend that those of you who did not raise your hand, that you're not doing co uh, virtual colonoscopy, to really consider doing it. I know that one of the issues is reimbursement, and I, I can't blame you if, you if you're not getting reimbursed for examination that you're doing, but we'll come back to reimbursement towards the end. Because if we don't do it, the gastroenterologist, or maybe even the cardiologist, will start doing virtual colonoscopy. <laughs> In any event, fecal DNA is also something for the future, but uh, currently the, the studies that have used fecal DNA to evaluate for colon cancer have been very dismal. So it is not something that can be used outside of a research protocol at the current time. Fecal occult blood testing. Guy's 63 years old. All right, positive fecal occult blood. We do a virtual colonoscopy, and sure enough, in the transverse colon, you see this small uh, polypoid lesion. It's about eight, nine millimeters. This is what we want to detect at colon cancer screening. This is not a cancer. This is a pre-malignant lesion. This is not like screening with lung cancer for very small cancers or breast cancer for early cancers. We're screening for pre-malignant disease, pre-cancerous changes. This kind of lesion, however, does not bleed. And in fact, the patient underwent a colonoscopy, and there you can see the lesion. It's not bleeding. Fecal occult blood testing does not detect colorectal polyps. What it does detect, and what it did detect in this patient, this is the same patient, this is the overview, double contrast BE look at the junction of the sigmoid and descending colon, there's an apple core lesion. We look at the endoluminal image, again, that apple core near obstructing uh, tumor. And the patient had a colonoscopy, which confirms that same lesion, the same morphology. In fact, this is what's bleeding. But it's already too late. I mean, this is an invasive carcinoma. In fact, this guy has multiple pulmonary metastases. Had this guy undergone screening when he was 50 years old, chances are he wouldn't be in the situation that he's in uh, currently. And that is with extremely aggressive chemotherapy, uh, which, in fact, cost a lot of money. I mean, the chemotherapy for colon cancer nowadays with antibodies to, to endothelial growth factors can be up to $80,000 for the treatment. When you talk about the price of screening and the cost of screening, you have to factor in the treatment for those patients that ultimately get colon cancer who did not undergo colon cancer screening. Clearly, colonoscopy is the gold standard. I think despite all of our best tests so far, it probably has the best sensitivity, clearly for diminutive lesions and probably for larger lesions as well, although I think a well-performed virtual colonoscopy in somebody that knows what they're doing performs very similar to a conventional colonoscopy. And, of course, you have the ability to biopsy and remove lesions if you see them. But this person had a two-millimeter lesion at the colonoscopy. It was biopsied, and you can see the result. The patient develops uh, intraperitoneal and retroperitoneal g gas. The patient required surgery. And about one to three in a thousand patients who undergo a colonoscopy and a biopsy will run into a perforation, problems with bleeding. There's other issues with sedation and the cost of sed the sedation. And the thought of biopsying every small lesion really raises the price of screening colonoscopy because not only 
is there a price for the polypectomy, but there's a price for the polyp interpretation. So it's a problem. And we see, and, but you know, I'm, again, I'm not, uh, I've had a colonoscopy. I know some of my colleagues have. Um, and you know, with the sedation that's given now, really, you don't recall a thing. But sometimes I look at the price for the sedation was more than the colonoscopy itself. We see from time to time some other complications. I'm just going to show you this case. It's from the other day, just uh, if, you ha if you haven't seen this. Actually, this was written by a colleague of mine, Dr. Birnbaum, will be talking uh, uh, in a little while. But this is a complication that we see from time to time after a colonoscopy. The patient had a normal screening colonoscopy. Seven hours later, there was no biopsy done, came into the emergency room complaining of left-sided abdominal pain. What we see here is a segmental colitis involving the descending colon and the sigmoid colon. You can see the wall thickening, the target appearance. Anybody know what this is? Well, this is something known as glutaraldehyde colitis. Glutaraldehyde is the disinfectant that's used to clean the scopes. It's not that the scope isn't clean, it's just that that glutaraldehyde wasn't washed properly off of the scope. And it actually causes like a toxic ischemic burn type of injury to the colon. And so you will see this from time to time, and just keep that in mind as, as another potential, you know, I don't, again, I don't want to um, really say anything negative about colonoscopies. I think it really still is the reference standard, but there are issues with uh, colonoscopy. So let's talk about virtual colonoscopy, because we do have the problems with colon cancer, with colonoscopy, with other screening techniques, in that we still have about 140 to 150,000 new cases every year in this country. Well, the truth is, is that, you know, I still read papers and journals. Uh, virtual colonoscopy is a new and exciting technique for the potential use for colon cancer screening. That's nonsense. Virtual colonoscopy has been around for 11 years. You know, I remember when I was a resident at Cornell, Dr. Vining, Dave Vining, came up and gave us a lecture and showed us a movie. It was very crude at that time, or primitive, but it really kind of was just like, it just blew me away. I mean, the, the, the potential to look at the colon with, with CT for screening. And in fact, you know, again, the, this was published as an abstract in, in AJR in 1994, so it's 11 years. And at our own institution, we've been doing virtual colonoscopy since 1997, 1998, on a single slice scanner with five millimeter thick sections and a pitch of two. Remember, you get slice broadening with a higher pitch. So the effective slice thickness is 6.4 millimeters. We're able to acquire this data in a single breath hole. But notice that you can almost not really discern any of the folds on the coronal reformatted image, very limited other than looking in axial images. Obviously, you can see large polyps and cancers, and we published a number of papers using single slice scanners, but you know, when we got our four slice scanner, we quickly went to thin sections to obtain near isotropic images, and they weren't isotropic, but they were, they were close. In the z-axis, they were about 1.25 millimeters thick, in the x and y, about 0.7. We're still able to acquire this data in a 30-second breath hold in most patients. But a 16-slice scanner, we're down to 12 seconds, very similar at the same z-axis resolution. And in fact, on a 64-slice scanner, we're able to acquire the data in six seconds. I mean, there's no issues with peristalsis. There's no issues with breathing. You don't have to give glucagon for these examinations. Uh, it really it doesn't. There's been a number of papers. Maybe buscopan in Europe might help, but glucagon, I would hold off on using that. By the way, in the 30 minutes that I have here, there's certainly no way that I can talk about the techniques and, and, and everything regarding virtual colonoscopy, but I think that that's been pretty well published. But the point is, is that virtual colonoscopy has been around for a long time. There's been a lot of data in the use of it, and I think it just continues to improve not only the CT scanners, but the workstations that are available to us to evaluate that data, just as Alec was talking about with the pancreas. Now, we've done the vast majority of our virtual colonoscopy is on a four-slice scanner. And it works really quite well, but the one problem with a four-slice scanner, especially in people that have some issues with, with pulmonary issues, uh, is that you can run into some breath-holding problems. And here's a patient, you know, we started here, you can imagine one, two, three, four, maybe around 10, 12 seconds during the acquisition, the patient starts breathing. And that's going to limit your ability to evaluate that particular area of the colon. We now perform all of our virtual colonoscopies other than research colons on a 16-slice scanner. And I think really a 16-slice scanner is your optimal scanner for CT colonography because it be performed in a 12-second breath hold. You get very good z-axis resolution. Uh, the image quality, I think, is just a little bit better. But importantly, this is an 83-year-old guy. He had a colonoscopy that got stuck in the transverse colon because of this large frond-like obstructing carcinoma. 
the gastroenterologist, actually the surgeon asked us to do a virtual colonoscopy to look for synchronous lesions. Remember that there's about a 5% chance of having a synchronous lesion. And sure enough, just uh, proximal to the ileocecal valve, there is this plaque-like adenocarcinoma. So, uh, you know, I mean, it was clear to me that this is a second neoplasm, and it really changed the management of this patient, you know, an 83-year-old guy, because instead of having just that uh, transverse colon resected as a segmental resection, there was now extended right colectomy to just pass the, the cancer in the transverse colon. So here's the cecum, the ileocecal valve, the plaque-like lesion, just proximal to the, or distal, excuse me, to the ileocecal valve, and there was the obstructing cancer. Now, interestingly in this guy, he's an 83-year-old patient, and you say, well, you know, should we be screening people this age? Well, the truth is, is that your chances of getting an adenoma and a carcinoma and severe dysplasia increases as you get older. And there's no reason not to screen older patients if they're otherwise in good health. Because it would, it would be, you know, a pretty bad thing to be, have everything going right for you, you're just getting ready to retire, and because you're 75 years old, you don't want to do a colonoscopy, but you have a big colon cancer there. And we actually get a lot of referrals to screen these older patients, and I think in the future it's really going to be a, a role for virtual colonoscopy in screening older individuals who are certainly at risk for developing colon cancer but might be otherwise a little bit more risky patients for sedation and the more invasive uh, traditional colonoscopy. Now, how has virtual colonoscopy performed? Let me just share with you, and again, this is all on my website, these, these references, and this I think is a pretty interesting article. Uh, it was a meta-analysis of 33 studies of over 6,000 patients, which shows that virtual colonoscopy is highly specific for polyps over 9 millimeters. That means it's very rare for people that know how to interpret a CT colonography data set to refer somebody to colonoscopy because they thought something was a polyp and it turns out to be fecal material or a fold. And I think that with proper training that, that, that that's true. But the sensitivity varied widely among different studies. Overall, for polyps over nine millimeters, sensitivity was not bad, 85%, but there was a lot of variability in these different studies. And if you look at some of the uh, papers that were uh, quoted in this study, you can see from 2005 going back to 1997 that for polyps over nine millimeters, generally very good results. But I want to point your attention to this particular study by Dan Johnson from the Mayo Clinic. I suspect that they have the most experience with virtual colonoscopy than any other institution in the country and perhaps in the world. But they had three experienced readers look at that data and their sensitivity was only 46% for lesions 10 millimeters and greater. So there is, this is in an asymptomatic population, a screening population. We'll come back to why that may be. You'll also notice, interestingly, that our sensitivity in general is very poor for small lesions, I hear down to 7%. You know, generally it's about 25 to 30%. But again, I think the vast majority of those are not clinically relevant, and I'll, I'll talk on that in just a moment. Some of my colleagues from Rome, uh, I love these guys, but for whatever reason, they always have 100% sensitivity for, for, and even look for the diminutive lesions, 87%. So you gotta be careful with some of these papers. But. What about these small polyps that we have a difficult time seeing? Uh, this is a very interesting study. I recommend you read it if you have any interest. It's from Hoff in the Scandinavian Journal of Gastroenterology, 1986. I don't know if this could really be done currently, but they looked at 400 patients, aged 50 to 59, a screening cohort. They did colonoscopy, 215 polyps were detected that measured less than five millimeters, less than or equal to five millimeters. They did not remove any of them. Now, the current practice for most gastroenterologists, they see a small lesion, they remove it, and you know, it falls out, nobody knows what happened to it. But, but two years later, they went back and did colonoscopy on all of those patients again, and removed all of the polyps. You'll notice that 50% were hyperplastic, no clinical significance, 23% were mucosal tags, no clinical significance, and 23% were adenomas. Again, small adenomas appear not to grow, no polyp, in this study had grown to over five millimeters at the two-year surveillance, interestingly. Also, regression was noted because you'll see that this study does not equal 100%, so about four to five percent of lesions that were there were no longer seen. So there probably is some element of regression of small polyps, whether they were adenomas or hyperplastic polyps, but it seems like these little lesions are not growing. And you know, we can see them, especially using, you know, uh, good 3D techniques, to be honest with you. Here's a little three millimeter lesion in the colon, what do you do with this if you see it? You know, a, a colleague of mine up at Mayo Clinic, uh, excuse me, at Mass General, Mike Zalis, uh, took a group of experts in virtual colonoscopy. We came up with 
sort of a BIRADS type thing, but it's called CRADS, colon reporting and uh, detection systems. The report, uh, in this paper, and I'm not sure if I agree with it entirely, is that if you see lesions less than five millimeters, forget them, don't even report them. You know, assuming that patients are gonna come back in five years for surveillance, and I think there's some controversy among that, but you know, the truth is, is that the vast majority of thing, these things are not adenomas, and truthfully, the endoscopists have a very hard time finding them when I do tell them that I see something there that size. Regarding that meta-analysis, interestingly, multi-detector CT, more sensitive than single-detector CT. Okay, everybody knows that. But for every one millimeter increase in collimation, what this study showed was that there was a decrease in sensitivity by 5%. So again, I mean, when we started doing virtual colonoscopy, we used very thin sections. We continue to use thin sections. I strongly recommend you use thin section. It comes out to about 400 to 500 images per data set. But again, with good workstations, it really isn't a problem. Also, the meta-analysis suggested, but could not prove, that 3D imaging was better than 2D imaging for a data uh, analysis, for polyp detection. And I must admit that originally, when we started doing virtual colonoscopy, we used a 2D technique you know, start at the rectum, scroll through, looking for polyps. And the reason why is because we did not have workstations that were really capable of doing very rapid, good 3D fly-throughs. Now the workstations have much improved, and I always incorporate a fly-through. I still do an initial 2D review, but always incorporate a fly-through uh, in the examination because sometimes you're gonna see some lesions. And I just wanna point out, these are four big studies that have been published on virtual colonoscopy recently. A study by Johnson, which I already talked about, Picard, which actually had a better sensitivity for polyps over 10 millimeters than colonoscopy. The Peter Cotton study and the uh, Rocky study, both of these studies had about a 65, 70% uh, detection for colorectal polyps 10 millimeters or greater. Why did the Picard study do so much better? I don't think it's that he's a better radiologist than, than some of these other guys, although there was some issues of experience, particularly in the cotton study, but they used a 3D interpretation technique on all of their examinations. Let's look at this case. I've taught a lot of radiologists uh, my techniques of virtual colonoscopy. When they look at a 2D image, for example, this image on your left, they have a very difficult time. In fact, most people do not see the polyp, even when they're scrolling through the data. Does anybody see the polyp there? Well, there it is, and if we look at the uh, fly-through in this patient coming from the splenic flexure, heading down towards the hepatic flexure, the way the endoscopist would come, there it is. I mean, it's so easily seen, yet it's very difficult to see here. So I really suggest that you always incorporate a fly-through in your examinations. This is another recent examination, a recent case from just last week. If you scroll through the 2D images, I had a difficult time seeing this, Three of my residents looked at this case, they probably were listening downstairs, but they did not see this case on the 2D image. When I told them to look at the 3D image, by the way, there's the polyp, it looks like a fold, but look at what it looks like on the 3D fly-through. I mean, there it is. You're not gonna miss this lesion, and I really think that you have to incorporate a 3D fly-through in your examination. What about these lesions, these flat lesions? I mean, this is only slightly discolored, it is not raised at all. These lesions, unfortunately, you cannot see at virtual colonoscopy. But I must admit, in about 3,000 uh, virtual colonoscopies that I've done, about 1,300 of them with uh, colonoscopy correlation, there's only two of them that I know of that had lesions like this. In general, you know, and you just can't see these lesions. Flat lesions look more like this, right? They're slightly raised, irregular. You're gonna see them if you look for them, and really the differential diagnosis is not, is there nothing there, but it's more, is this adherent fecal material? You know, but you have a, a focal plaque-like lesion there. The colon is otherwise clean in this patient. You know, what you have to do, whether you're looking at it on the 2D or the 3D, is interrogate it with both techniques. And here on the so-called colon window level, what we really evaluate the colon with, very difficult to see. You change it to an abdomen window level, and you can see this kind of plaque-like lesion, which turns out to be a villus adenocarcinoma in this person's rectum. This guy came in for screening and was actually FOBT negative. Is there a difference in the histology of flat versus pedunculated versus sessile lesions. Because there's another thing that the gastroenterologist often talked to me about, well, you know, you're missing those flat lesions, they're more aggressive. Well, the truth is, is that we look at a recent study published by O'Brien, a pathologist from Boston University, looked at the data from the National Polyp Study. There were 474 baseline flat adenomas, that is, lesions less than two millimeters thick. 
what they found at the initial histology was that there was no increased risk of high-grade dysplasia or villus pathology compared to sessile or pedunculated lesions. And importantly, on follow-up imaging, there was no increased risk of development of uh, so-called bad lesions. So I think that that is something that is important for us. And remember, the most flat lesions aren't truly flat, but slightly raised. The current role of virtual colonoscopy, we talked about this a little bit. Um, I think in the future, it's going to really be screening, where virtual colonoscopy is going to play an important role to get more people screened and evaluated, and then those with significant lesions will undergo colonoscopy. I will tell you that we recently get getting reimbursed for patients on Coumadin. We're working on this. Uh, we've been getting reimbursed from Medicare for failed colons, and slowly reimbursement is coming. You know, but it's not there for everything, and it's certainly not there for the vast majority of asymptomatic screening patients. Patients often come in and pay for it out of their pocket. And here's a case of a patient came in for screening. There's a four millimeter lesion in the splenic flexor. What do you do with this? You know, I'm convinced it's a lesion. Here it is on the endoluminal view. I just put it in my report that there was a four millimeter lesion there. The patient uh, went for a colonoscopy, and at colonoscopy they found the same lesion. This was biopsied, and of course it was a hyperplastic polyp. Interestingly, I got a note from the gastroenterologist that was also sent to the patient. Listen, you have a polyp, come back in two years for repeat screening. This is an entirely bogus recommendation. This patient who has a hyperplastic polyp is good for 10 years according to the American Gastroenterological Association's recommendation. So even gastroenterologists seem not to be reading their own recommendations, although some of them are pretty, pretty smart. This is a guy who came in for screening in, no, in, in October 2001, and I saw a five millimeter polyp in the cecum, and here it is on the endoluminal view. I reported it as a five and a half millimeter polyp. As it turns out, over a year later, the guy comes back, and there's that same polyp, measures about 6.5 millimeters, probably within the range of normal for, for uh, measurement errors. And I call up the gastroenterologist, and he said, listen, this patient has uh, multiple cardiac and pulmonary diseases. I don't want to uh, subject him to sedation and the possible sequelae of that for a lesion that he's not going to die of. And we actually just repeated a, a virtual colonoscopy on the guy. The lesion is entirely the same. So, you know, shouldn't all polyps be removed? The answer is no, and you have to take it in the context of how that patient is doing. In fact, a study from the Mayo Clinic back in the days of barrier menema looked at the risk of cancer in large polyps, that is, polyps 10 millimeters or greater. Now they follow, this is when you, let's say you had a, a lesion 10 millimeters in your right colon at a barium enema. Your two choices were to do a right colectomy or to follow it. They followed about 200 of these lesions and the risk at 20 years of developing a cancer in there was only 24%. So even large lesions, if they're gonna progress, seem to progress very slowly. Now here's a patient who does have a large lesion in the right colon, it's about nine millimeters. This is April, 2003. This person came back for follow-up. He's 80 years old. They didn't want to do a colonoscopy at the initial time. That same lesion now measures 12.2 uh, millimeters. So it's definitely grown in the year and a half. This patient underwent a colonoscopy, and this was removed, and it was a tubular adenoma. So again, I mean, you can follow lesions with virtual colonoscopy. Not everything needs to be removed. And I think if you have a normal colon at virtual colonoscopy, you're good for five years. Controversial, if a lesion is less than five millimeters, should you report it, should you not? If you have a lesion over five millimeters, probably should go to colonoscopy unless there's contraindications, as I previously pointed out. And the last minute uh, that I have, what is the future of virtual colonoscopy? Maybe I should be spending more time on this, but this is the future. The future is prepless CT colonography and computer-aided detection. Now, really, neither of these things are uh, really, I think, working currently entirely prepless CT colonography. Computer-aided detection algorithms are on uh, a number of different vendors' workstations, including both of the workstations that I use. I think that CAD is going to be very helpful in the future uh, in helping to detect polyps, especially those in the six to nine millimeter range. Of course, training, reimbursement, and other display methods are going to be important as well. We're doing some research right now using barium um, to tag the fecal material in patients who have a a low fat, low fiber diet, and we have not missed a polyp over 10 millimeters. They can be more challenging, but you know, again, scrolling on the, and you cannot do a 3D review. But again, I don't think we're looking for small polyps, and this is probably gonna be reserved for people that are older and can't tolerate preps. But there's the lesion on the tagged and the clean colon, and you can see it, this polyp among the tagged fecal material on the endoluminal view, and there it was at colonoscopy. Computer-aided detection is gonna be very important.
A number of investigators have been using this. We have it on one of our workstations. This is a case where I did not see anything on the axial review. On the endoluminal view, right at the orifice of the appendix, there's this lesion. I don't know, is this just a fold? The computer said, put one, two, three marks on this, said that this is a polyp. And I don't know, I think it might have biased me. I said, okay, this is a polyp. The patient went to endoscopy, and there it is. Again, it looks kind of fold-like. It was removed. This is a tubular adenoma in the cecum, and I think in this case, CAD actually helped me in, uh, in, in coming down hard on that diagnosis. So in conclusion, you know, the adenoma carcinoma sequence accounts for the vast majority of colon cancer, and yet we still have a problem with the number of cases that are occurring. Current screening techniques are inadequate, and I think virtual colonoscopy will absolutely impact on colon cancer screening, but again, it's up to all of us to really get involved with that. And there's the website if you need further information on this technique. Thank you.